the Know Your Gear podcast. Hey everyone, welcome to the Know Your Gear podcast episode 347 and uh, getting closer to that 350 mark. Hope everybody had a great week and uh, and uh, we have a lot of questions I'm sure already in the in the uh, in the queue i saw a couple early questions um and i and i also have questions throughout the week that came in so a couple things so let's take it before we get started uh first um the uh th this week i had a sinus infection so it's been a little uh daunting on me <laughs> and uh they gave me some stuff and that stuff uh, seems to make everything uh not worse, just not better. <laughs> so, all right. So with that in mind, let's uh, let's get into some cool stuff that's going on. So the first thing I want to talk about is I want to, again, thank you all. Uh, two weeks ago, we ran a promotion with, uh, with Tim Pierce for the masterclass. And in fact, I'll show you right there. And uh, tons of you signed up. I appreciate that very much. Like I said, uh, this is the last weekend for it. So we should do a last shout out. Uh, if you sign up, you get 30% off and they kick a little back uh, back to the channel and you'll uh be uh you'll be able to join a uh, a clinic a online clinic so to speak with tim pierce and myself we did this last year a lot of you guys joined us last year um uh as well so let's uh let's just say uh I, you know it was a good time <laughs> so it was a good time and um <laughs> and uh, I think a lot of you guys enjoyed it. So if you guys are interested, you can sign up and get a discount. Also, I should point out, this is probably the most important part. Uh, there's a 14-day free trial. So you get to try it for two weeks uh, without having to pay for it, so to speak. So, uh, you know, if you're interested, give it a try. This is the last weekend. We won't be doing this again for the year. Um, this is just something that when Tim and I talk, you know, we're like, hey, you know, he's like, if you think your audience would uh, enjoy a, a discount, uh, I would gladly uh, give it to them. And so we thought we would do this for sure. So, all right. Hope you guys sign up uh, before the, it ends. All right. Let's get into the first question, if you don't mind. The first question I saw from the early riser came from the real Christopher Ryan, who says, thinking about replacing my pickups in my PRS S2 594. Uh, they're a bit dark and muddy. Uh, what do you think of the 5708s? Uh, I, I think the 5708s will be a lot brighter than uh, what is in your S2594 currently. Um, the uh, In the pickup range of PRS, I mean, there's so many different pickups, but I would definitely say um, the number one comment about all the S2 guitars is that they sound a little dark. The pickups that they put in the S2s seem a little dark. And... Um, and uh, it's been probably one of the biggest critiques of the S2s uh, series is that uh, either the pickups are dark or that people don't like the fact that they have import pickups in a USA made guitar. And um, and uh, I think one of the things you can do to make the S2 if you want it to sound a little bit more like the core is definitely just put the core pickups in there. Uh, 5708s are great and 5909s are also great as well. Um, so I would say uh, I would go either way if I was you. Um, so 5708s definitely do the job. The um, the other uh, follow-up, not a follow-up, but another uh, question says, Kent, <laughs> Kent, who says, Poodles for me, <laughs> so I think it's Kent Poodles for me, says, what was it about the SE594 that you couldn't bond with? Just curious. Thanks, Phil. Um, well, it's not the SE, the 594. I've, I've had the 594 SE. I've had the 594 Core. I mean, I personally own them. Uh and I've had the 594S2, both the thin line and the regular. <laughs> so I've had all the 594s. And for me, it's it's an amazing guitar. It's one of PRS's best guitars. It, it plays amazing. Just for me, there was two things that I just didn't bond with. And I think the way you said it was perfect, bond. Uh, I didn't bond with the neck thickness was just a little thick. And the shorter scale made the strings just a little bit easier for me to bend. And I didn't really love that. I don't need the guitar to fight me back, but I didn't want it to be so effortless. Um, and I think if that's something you're looking for, I think that guitar is going to be fantastic. Sound-wise, playability, all that stuff was definitely on on par for me. And I was definitely good with it. Um, you know, so, I mean, that, there was nothing there holding me back. Out of all the 594s, I think the 594 Thin Line was my favorite. That uh, Why I bought that was... 
it has the uh, pattern thin neck or pattern regular neck. So it has the smaller neck. Um, and I had that one and I absolutely love the guitar. I thought it played great. I thought it felt great. And again, the neck now, so it got it down to just, just the string tension. And it was, um, it still wasn't even bad guitar. It was a great guitar. I just felt like I had other guitars that I just felt like I wanted to play instead. And that's what happens a lot of times. You know, obviously there's a lot of guitars behind here um, because of, you know, the YouTube channel. And, you know, it's like personal guitars mixed with guitars that are involved with the YouTube channel in some way. And, uh, you know, I just can't own everything, so to speak. But also there's just certain guitars I bond with personally from my personal time more so than, than the YouTube time. Um, El Dudorino says, I call it wobbly strings. Yeah, it's just, you know, and so, so, you know, I had tens on there. I thought about putting 11s, uh, and, and 11s might've done the trick. Um, but it was just, I, I really like, um, when I got to the, the, the PRS 594 thin line, it reminded me so much of my Mira, which I think is my Mira here. Oh yeah. It's at the bottom right there behind me, right there. Uh, my PRS Mira that, uh, then it became like, okay, which one do I prefer out of the two? And for me, I preferred the mirror out of the two, mostly because I've had it for, you know, 10 years now. I've had the mirror for over 10 years. Well, just over 10 years. And uh, let's just say I'm bonded to it at this point. It's a guitar that I love to play and and uh, I, I like it. Um, Let's see. Uh, Corey says, hey, what is your technique for measuring uh, neck thickness with the strings on? Do you have a video showing that? I don't have a way to measure the thickness of a neck with the strings on. Um, I thought about uh, making a caliper and cutting the grooves from the strings, you know, in there, kind of like how the notched um, radius gauges are. And I thought about using something like that. Um, what can probably you might be thinking of is a lot of times in the videos I'm showing the neck thickness and then maybe when I'm showing the caliper you see the strings on um, there there is there is two ways I measure the neck thickness depending on where I am in the video with what I'm doing in the geeky stuff the deep dive um, the obvious way is removing the strings so I remove the strings 100% and then I caliper the thickness of the first and 12th fret to give you those guys those to give you guys those readings um, however however um, sometimes like in the case, I just recently did the, uh, PRS, uh, 2408, um, that guitar was going back. I already had a return label for it. It had to go back. It was a loner, uh, so to speak. Um, that was a, um, sometimes companies like Paul Reed Smith guitars, uh, will give you an advance, you know, kind of look at a guitar before it comes out in the market. And, um, and what I like about those type of scenarios, uh, is that that doesn't require a video. So um, if they send the guitar, if I, if I do the video, great. I mean, obviously they want me to do the video, but I'm, I, I'm getting an advanced look at it. And I kind of look, look to see if it's worth doing a video about. Um, and that's what happened in that case. So the guitar was not like left behind or, or something like that. So um, I didn't really want to take it apart fully because <clears throat> I don't know where it goes next. I don't know if it's going back. Well, it goes, went back to PRS, but I don't know if it's going to a dealer or what have you. So what I did on that one was I loosened the strings uh, and then I put the calipers underneath the strings uh, and calipered the neck uh, with a spacer. So I guess there is a kind of a trick. I have a spacer that like a foam block that I can loosen the strings. I put the foam block underneath the second fret. And then I think uh, again, I round the seventh fret and then I can run the caliper underneath there and do the measurements. Um, I didn't leave the foam block in, in frame. It just didn't make sense because once I did it, I just wanted to show you where I was with that. Um, but I think if you watch that video a little bit closer, you'll see the strings. There's a few strings that are still not tightened up. They're all like loose and not lined up. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mike says after review of the pedal pal 800 V4, I bought one best Marshall pedal I have ever used. Thanks, Phil. I absolutely agree. It's my favorite Marshall pedal ever. And a lot of times when you say that stuff, look, Whenever I talk, especially pedals, like I said, the pedal forums in the pedal world is a little different than, I believe it or not, the guitar world and the amp world, a little different circles. Um, that pedal is my absolute favorite Marshall pedal sound. When I say Marshall, I mean literally sounds as close to my ears as my Marshalls, the Marshalls I owned, um, which is why I liked it. Um, there are a lot of great Marshall pedals. 
Uh, you know, I have like the, you know, I've shown the purple, here's one here, right here, the purple plexi. This is a good pedal, but I love pedals. Uh, Lawrence uh, Petros makes some great uh, Marshall style pedals. Um, a lot of companies do, but I really think like, I, I use this as a, when I'm talking, I'll, I'll maybe explain it like this. I look at the BE 100 pedal or the BE, right? So the uh, Friedman BE pedal as, of course, Friedman's are Marshall-esque, but they're definitely hot rotted or changed or juiced or whatever you want to call it. They're Marsh, everything you like about Marshall, but a little better <laughs> in my opinion. And uh, so that's, you know, just like uh, Dr. Z makes a, a Vox and so does, uh, you know, uh, Morgan Amps, I think they make Voxes that are like Voxes, but also a little better than Voxes. You know, some of the things that you didn't like about those amps improved. Um, sometimes you just want the sound to be exactly like that. And the JC100 is this classic, I think, sound that I just like to have an amp that sounds, or a pedal that sounds exactly like it. I used to want an amp, um, which is why, if you guys remember, I had the full size head. I got rid of it and got the studio. The studio was a disappointment to me, not because it didn't sound good. I thought it sounded great. The studio was a disappointment because it just, it doesn't get quiet. I mean, you have to, you still have to run it through attenuation. And at that point, I might as well run the 100 watt head through attenuation. It won't matter at this point. Um, and so, um, and, uh, you know, so sometimes it's nice to have a pedal. Uh, so that's why I like the Pedal Pal 800 for that. And I've tried so many Marshall pedals. It's just one of my favorites. Plus, like I said, I'm biased. I'm really good friends with the guys who make them. Um, and uh, I think they're great guys. But more importantly, I think they're really talented at Marshall stuff. I mean, it's just, that seems to be their forte. Um, the, uh, I think when I think of Lawrence, like L LPD pedals, I think of Lawrence is looking at a sound and going, okay, I want that sound, but I want it like, perf not perfected, but he wants this right, this correct sound, the sound that's in his head. Actually, it's probably better. He wants the sound that's in his head. Uh, Lewis and the guys at Pedal Pal, they're definitely just trying to clone the Marshall sound as accurately as possible. And, uh, and they go to painstaking uh, <laughs> depths to get that. So uh, there you go. So there you go on that note. Um, okay, the next comment I saw was uh, Steve Cassidy Guitar says, do you have a favorite fretboard radius? Ah, uh, 12. 12, I, you know, I used to not think I did, but I do. Um, and how I found out I do have a favorite radius was from Kiesel Guitars. Um, the, the uh, relationship with Kiesel Guitars, which is one of my favorite relationships being on YouTube, okay, um, is it's a, it's exactly like what I, I I'm sorry, you, Steve, you probably didn't ask this, but I got to give you this, this background. Uh, it's the relationship I always thought I was going to have with every company uh, on YouTube. Um, and, um, and so, you know, I have a lot of great relationships on YouTube and I'm not, I'm not taking away from that. But the one thing about the Kiesel guys, they don't, They've never paid the channel. They've never given me a single solitary dollar. Um, I've never asked, and and so and they've actually offered, <laughs> and I and I, I even said no when when offered uh, some kind of financial you know uh, compensation cash wise. And the relationship I have with them is I've told them many times is I like being able. I mean, who doesn't? It's a dream dream world. I like being able to um, order a guitar from you guys and have it on my channel and use it if I can use it. And, um, and the reason why I say it's a dream situation is a lot of times, you know, companies are really focused on, yeah, I'd say, Hey, look, I'm really interested in this guitar. Can you send it out to the channel? It'd be awesome. I will use it in every video. You guys hear this all the time. I'll promote it. It'll be great. I'm really excited about this guitar. And, and, uh, what a great way if you can, you know, work, make some kind of mutual benefit between the two, two entities, this channel and that company. But most companies really are focused on the, well, we really need to promote the new one the new thing. And so the Kiesel guys were like, whatever you want. And so because they were like, whatever you want, I would just get a little crazy. And so one of the things I've done is I've messed with it by ordering different guitars with different fretboards. Um, uh, nine and a half, 10, 12, 16, 14, a uh, compound radius, 12 to 16, right? Whatever, whatever thing I've done, I've done. And what I found myself always, always going to was the 12 inch radius uh, compound, our 12 inch radius, not even compound. I don't have a problem with compound radius. I don't have a problem with 14 or 16 or nine and a half, but you asked me what my favorite is, it's 12 and it seems to be something I gravitate towards every time. I'm, I'm just fine with it. And I think it's because it's no thoughts for me. I just pick up the guitar and play. And ultimately, that to me is the perfect guitar. I pick it up, I play it. I don't really think about why I'm playing it. I'm just doing it. So that's what happens. Uh, and uh, so that's how I was able to do that was 
was mess with all the the ones. Um, my uh, single cut bevel has a 10 inch radius fretboard, and if I would have done it again, I would have done 12 on that. But I thought, oh, you know what? Maybe I like just something a little bit more rounder than you know than 12, but not as round as nine and a half. So I went 10. You know, subtle difference. And uh, and as much as I like PRS guitars, I still like 12s. Okay. Uh, okay. Wait, hold on. Um, okay, I'm not old. I'm vintage. This. I'm sometimes I get annoyed by how great all gear is when I had to learn on stuff that was that I wanted to fight. Yeah. Well, I think that's the reason why YouTube channels have become successful. Um, I think why the video platforms became successful. I think this wouldn't have happened if gear was crappy. If gear was like it was when we first started out, you know, years and years and years and years ago, when it was just all, you know, like the stuff was either sounded horrible or it sounded great and there was really no in-betweens. Uh, so you just had to have the money to pony it up. Everybody knew what to do. You just paid a lot of money, <laughs> right? You just bought a Marshall instead of, a, you know, instead of a a, a a Gorilla amp, you know, right? You bought the real deal. Um, and same thing with guitars, you know, you, you know, you just bought the real deal. Um, but as everything got better, it got more confusing. And to the point where everyone has option paralysis all the time. Um, so it just would be, uh, it would be crazy, I think, if, if every video was like, you know, you listen to an old grill amp and then a, a really nice, could you imagine try comparing somebody comparing a spark and a grill amp? <laughs> like, which one should you get? <laughs> so there you go. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, I didn't understand. I'm sorry, I was reading, I saw a question, but I didn't understand your, the question I... It didn't make sense. Okay. Uh, hold on. Let me scroll down and drink water. Okay. Um, let's see. Derek says, that's true. Cheap gear in the early 80s was garbage. Yeah, it was pretty bad. Uh, now even the lower end stuff is decent and there's almost limited uh limitless parts places uh you can easily mod an instrument you know what's funny is is and a lot of people are really kind of say like the reason everything got really good really cheap is because it all went to you know overseas like asian asian markets right and and that that does i mean that's a huge thing but there was affordable gear before the problem was the problem was is that um we didn't have the information we have now. See, the thing, thing, the thing I, I notice now is everything has been copied so much, <laughs> you know. Um, and I mean everybody. I mean everybody has done this. It's not even a like a, a you know Harley Benton gets all the credit, you know, for knocking off people. But you know the high end companies do it too. You know, I, I you know I I remember the first time. Uh, I heard uh, Paul Smith uh, at PRS talking about the magic of the 59 Les Paul. I was in a, a meeting thing that he was there at, is at the factory, and he was telling the story, and I was there with a bunch of people, and he was saying how they took the pickups apart and sent them to a lab, <laughs> you know, and reverse engineered this guitar uh, in every, you know, in basically in every way basically. And, uh, you know, and they found out exactly where they were getting, what the magic to the wire was and what the magic to the parts were. And so it just, you know, it's funny. It's like that, you know, that's him taking apart a guitar he loves and then uh, analyzing it. The amp guys do the same thing. The pedal guys do the same thing. And the result is eventually that you can get great stuff dirt cheap because, the dirt cheap guys do the same thing. They just analyze what somebody else did. And I've said this before, I'll say it again. I don't think components are the main factor that makes things sound good or bad. I think it's the it's the artist behind it, the engineer, the designer, the tech, whatever you want to call it. Um, knowing exactly how to shape a neck, exactly how to make that amp sound perfect with the mid-range. Um, uh, I've I've found many times interviewing amp guys, especially amp guys more so than anyone else, that formula seems to be more powerful than, you know, ingredients. And um, 
and ingredients seems to be the focus of the internet. <laughs> you know, what parts are in it? This, if it's got good parts, it's a good amp. But I, in my experience, some of the amps with the best parts have just not done anything for me. And then this amp that's $500 is doing everything for me. I, I think, again, it's the, it's the person setting the tone, setting where it's going to sound good or not. So uh, let's see. Uh, no one's asked me yet. Let's go back. Hold on. Music Life with Arthur Gonzalez. Okay. That nice sign on. He says, if you could get Gibson to take a step towards the modern world without price gouging, what would you have them do? Um, what would I have Gibson do to take a step towards the modern world? Hmm. Well, I don't necessarily long for anything modernized with Gibson. And I mean, Gibson's prices are are high because they're expensive stuff. It's, I don't really long for anything for Gibson. I, I wish some, I wish Gibson would make guitars lighter. That's about it. Cause I, you know, I, I would be nice if I went on, you know, Sweetwater or if I went to Eddie's music or if I went to Wildwood guitars or you name it. Um, and I looked at the guitars with the weights, uh, cars, vintage guitars, post weights, you know, I go to the stores online, uh, rainbow guitars down in Tucson, Arizona. I go to a lot of websites where they post the weights cause that's what I'm interested in. And, you know, to see the pound, the guitar is all 10 pounds, 9 pounds, 10 pounds, 9 pounds, 11 pounds, 10 pounds. You know, it's like, ugh. you know, uh, it would be nice if they would do weight relieved. I think that's a modernized technique. Um, one of my concerns as someone who likes lighter guitars and a market that seems to be dominating, uh, getting dominated by people who like lighter guitars. Lighter guitars are definitely the thing, um, not only because you have an aging market <laughs> that doesn't want heavy guitars on their shoulders and stuff. It's just, you know, there's no reason to have a 12 pound guitar anymore. There's nothing to it. Um, there's no reason for it. In other words, we used to believe there was a secret tone in heavy guitars and that's not really, um, uh, you know, not going to be, you know, not always the case, but my point with the, uh, guitars being weight relieved, I wish they would weight relieve more. I wish more companies would go into weight relief because what I'm noticing is, and this came up this week with the, uh, Paul Reed Smith talking about the plastic tuners, right? <laughs> okay. Um, you know, Paul Reed Smith PRS guitars have added uh, aluminum, aluminum, whatever you call it, bridges and, you know, to the hard, to the, you know, to the, um, uh, to the, uh, stop tail bridges, not to the actual tremolos, but, um, they're doing things like lightening up the tuning keys. It seems like a lot of manufacturers, obviously Gibson using a aluminum, uh, stop tail bridge. A lot of companies are lightening up parts to lighten up the weight. And that's, I guess that's fine. But sometimes I wonder, I'm like, can't we just weight relieve the body? <laughs> so, um, and I think they, they're afraid to, because there's so much stigma to that. Uh, you know, people saying, oh, the weight relief guitars don't sound as good. And, uh, and this is probably true, but like I said, when we say doesn't sound as good, I mean, what, what percentage is it half as good? Is it sound horrible? It doesn't sound horrible. I mean, if you AB a guitar that's 12 pounds and you AB a guitar that's seven pounds, same one, but one's weight relieved. Does the solid one sound better? If it does, how much better? I mean, it's got to sound a lot better for it to matter to me. So... Uh, let's see. Hold on a second. I thought I missed. Uh, let's see. I'm not old. I'm vintage says I used to be slightly ambivalent about Gibson, but I have been loving what the new management is doing. So, uh, so obviously that's a good segue to talk about. Do you guys all see the new, uh, Gibson amplifiers? Let's uh, show those. Um, Okay, the new Gibson amplifiers. Do they come up what on guitarcenter.com? What are they coming up on? Let's see. Hmm. All right, let's share this. Okay, so oh, I don't have a, a screen to share. Why doesn't it share? It just went dark. Let's try this again. Nope. So apparently I don't have my web set up to set up like that. Hmm. Let's see if I can fix that real fast. Hold on, just gonna be one second. Okay. Let's see. If... Let's 
see if that works. Still doesn't work. Okay, let's see if this works. Still doesn't work. All right, sorry guys. Nothing I can do. I can't bring in my screen for some reason. I apologize. Anyways, uh, so the Gibson amps, they have two amps. They have a 112 and a 110. The 110 is sitting in at six watts and $1,500. And the uh, 112 is sounds like it's 20 watts and it sits at $1,800. And I'm sure everybody's going to have opinions about that. But one of the things that I thought was interesting was um, I didn't think they were as expensive as I thought they were going to be. Now, if you don't know this, they're probably built by or they're pretty much built by uh, Mesa Boogie. That's not a secret. Um, that's what Gibson bought Mesa Boogie for. They went to Mesa Boogie originally not to buy Mesa Boogie. This is their words, not mine. Gibson went to Mesa Boogie to have them build these Gibson amps. And that was kind of like the focus. And then there was an opportunity to buy the brand. Um, it seems to me, Gibson seems eager and I kind of have to be apprehensive. I am apprehensive. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm apprehensive to say this, but I kind of, you know, I'm just going to say it. Gibson seems to be trying to buy a lot of companies again. Um, I have more now than I'm up to three and that's too many. In my case, I have three people I know in this industry that have companies that Gibson have tried to purchase recently or recently being in the last year. And, um, and, uh, and when I say try, I mean, there was a discussion to purchase. Uh, so interesting. And, uh, and, uh, so Gibson seems to be in the, maybe in the going to acquire companies, uh, thing. However, there's also seems to be a little bit of this, uh, what Gibson can't buy, they're just going to make it themselves, make, make their own. It's a really interesting thing. I wish I could talk more about it. It's one of those things that kind of sucks. I'm kind of bound, but that going back to the Gibson amps, um, uh, I thought the prices were obviously not affordable. It's not not even close to affordable. But given the prices of what Fenders are asking now and what companies, what Mesa Boogie charges, I didn't think they were so crazy priced for what they are. Um, I don't really have any desire to own one. I think my main reason is I only watched uh, the the patrons sent me a, a clip. And the clip they sent me was, I guess, the official Gibson video. And I thought that sounded horrible. <laughs> In fact, the comments before kind of set me up. They were like, man, what's with that cord at like 29 seconds? And I was like, huh. And I watched him like, oh, yeah, what was that? Um, I think even Landon Bailey sent me something. And he was like, what is this? Why does it sound like this or something? Why did it sound this bad? I think he said that. I might have said that after. He's, I think he just said, what do you think? Um, uh, Quilted Maple says, are they hand wired? They are not hand wired. Um, the, they have pictures online if you want to see their, their boards and the innards and stuff. Uh, what I thought I saw was through hole boards, um, but not like point to point uh, hand wired. Um, I don't think they're, uh, I mean, technically, I think they're a little hand wired because I think that's how, you know, looking at them. But I mean, they're not point to point hand wired. They're not like vintage spec uh, amps. They're, they're more in line with what you'd see inside of a, of a Mesa Boogie amp. So there, so if that matters to you, it seems to matter to you guys a lot. Uh, I have, like I said, I have all this, I'm looking on the side. I have all the spectrum of amps, everything from PC boards to hand wired. And, and, uh, you know, I could tell you guys, look, everybody needs to do their own journey and figure it out themselves. Um, I didn't know what to think about roasted maple next. So I bought a bunch, <laughs> I played them all and I ended up liking them as a whole, but not liking a lot of them. And so I kept a few. Um, I, you know, anytime there's some new thing on the market or some discussion, I'm always curious to the point where I, you know, I'm just obsessed about it and I buy it and I check it out. And, you know, hand-wired amps are great, but I just have not found a hand-wired amp that is so great uh, that I just can't get close to it with, you know, PC board stuff. It's better. It always is. Don't get me wrong. Um, you know, I've said this before, I, uh, when I was reviewing the Amplified Nation stuff, that stuff, you know, compare my Fender mass produced product to it. Um, it is better than my Fender stuff in in every way, but it's also twice the price. So yeah, I would, it's, it's better because it's, it's better, but it's twice the price. So let's see. Oh, uh, Michael wants to know, speaking of Gibson's are <laughs> Gibson, are you going to put your pickups in a case and quadruple the price? So, uh, if you guys didn't see that Gibson came out with these like, uh, authentic 59, uh, P PAFs, right. Um, in double, I, I don't even understand this in double white, 
they weren't just saying double cream, obviously. They're saying double off, uh, like off white, but they've got a nickel cover. Uh, so who cares what's underneath the nickel cover? Anyways, um, and uh, they come in a case and they're $1,000 and they're doing a thousand of them. And, uh, you know, I told you how I feel about that stuff. <laughs> you know how I feel about it. That's a cash grab. There's, there's nothing that's justifying that price. Um, and, and there's no reason for me personally to judge anyone who wants that, by the way. Uh, it's not, I'm not trying to make friends with everybody, but I mean, I wouldn't care if you bought one. I'd be like, I wouldn't say, oh, you're an idiot. I'd just be like, I get it. You want it because to me, that stuff, that stuff, it's what I've talked about this before. It's when they made the $25,000 Eddie Van Halen replicas. Okay. That stuff becomes collector's items, collect memorabilia. Okay. When, when Fender did the Game of Thrones guitars, um, memorabilia, you know, uh, when, remember when BC Rich did the, uh, the crackle guitars for, um, the stranger things and people were outraged at the price. And I said it here, right here on this show, I go, it's not a guitar. It's memorabilia. <laughs> people who love stranger things are going to buy more of those guitars than guitar players are because they love the show and they just want to hang this on the wall. So when I see a thousand dollar set of Gibson PF pickups in a case, I, I, it's, I don't look at that as a real musical instrument product anymore. I look at that as if you, I see, I've seen people buy a thousand dollar lightsaber replica, replica in a case, right? Um, so, you know, that's why they do it. Um, and, and I hate to, I hate, to, I hate this part, but I'm sure the stupid thing goes up in value because you buy it and the next year everybody's getting like $1,800 a set because they got their set. Um, uh, but, you know, there's, there's nothing in those pickups that make them a thousand dollars. There's nothing. Uh, there's nothing. There's just no way. Um, there's nothing, nothing in those pickups that literally could cost that number that would make that number make sense other than the collectability factor of it. Um, and that is, has value too, but yeah, I saw it. I see it. Um, you know, it, I don't know. Thought it was interesting. Uh, okay, uh, let's let's go, let's go to another question. Let me actually do this. Let me jump in a screen and go here because I feel like I'm gonna miss something. I'm I'm not I haven't even grabbed the moderator screen yet, so I'm sure Amanda's on it. There it is, right there. Uh, oh, and by the way, Brian mentioned the pickups too. Um, Amanda sent me this. It says, is a Floyd Rose special as bad as people make it out to be? I was looking to buy a guitar that has one. I don't think it's as bad as uh, people make it out to be. Um, my issue with the bridge is connected to the price of the guitar the bridge is in. Um, it is disappointing to see a $3,000 guitar with the most inexpensive pieces of equipment in it. You know, um, I, there's no real logic to that other than the same logic of a car, right? You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to buy the, the, one of the most expensive cars on the market and find out they're putting the cheapest tires, the cheapest brakes, the cheap, you know, there's just a little, you know, you, you know, if you buy a $80,000 uh, car and they have the cheapest tires, cheapest brakes and the cheapest uh, materials for the seats, you would be a little like, this doesn't make any sense. What am I missing here? Um, you're not missing anything. It's, it's horrible, right? Cause, uh, and that's how I feel about guitars. So this in particular to your question, to, to, is it as bad as people say? No. Do I have a problem with it? No. In fact, um, I own a guitar with that uh, Floyd Rose special in it. Um, I own a guitar with all kinds of Floyd. I have all the Floyd Roses and <laughs> some guitar and some version because different price points. I personally, in Floyd Rose, I prefer the Schaller made German ones the most. And sadly enough, older ones over newer ones. I think even I have a newer and an older Schaller German Floyd Rose and a, my older one, uh, I think is a little better. It's just, everything feels a little machined a little better. Um, but, uh, no. And when people say the big complainer, the complaint is that these things don't stay in tune. In my experience, there are, uh, there are factors. There are things uh, that can cause a guitar to stay out of, you know, not stay in tune, like, like a bridge like that. But I've set up a ton of guitars and those guitars have stayed in tune. No problem. 
I'm not saying that they won't stay in tune. Some, some of them are going to have defective bridges, but as a bridge as a whole, no one's making, in my opinion, no one's making a bridge in the modern world right now that you shove on guitars that literally won't stay in tune. Because because how would anyone sell it used? How would you sell the guitar? Everybody knows, everybody knows it wouldn't stay in tune. Um, and uh, so, no, to answer your question, I don't I don't know. There's no issue issues with it. Um, <laughs> so I'm enjoying some of the car, uh, car comments. Uh, let's see. Hmm. Okay. Um, what else? Uh, she has another one for me too. I saw it. Hold on. Let me get out of that and go here. Um, let's see. This is from Mike. Uh, thank you, Amanda. It says, hey, Phil, I have a Epiphone Casino Coupe. And the two P90s have the same polarity. Is this normal? Yeah, that's normal. Uh, none of my other P90 guitars are like that. Uh, if not normal, how do I correct this? Uh, well, it is normal. So what I mean by normal is um, they don't have to uh, have two P90s reverse polarity. Um, you know, it, it's not it's not not required. Just like so, you know, single Fender single coil uh, strats. You know, some strats. Uh, especially the vintage 50 style are going to have uh, three single coils and there's not going to be a reverse wound reverse polarity in the center. So it'll be three normal ones. Um, uh, guys like um, uh, uh, Wiggins pickups, uh, he makes a lot of pickups and I think he does now he'll do a reverse wound reverse polarity in the center, but a lot of times he wasn't doing that. He was doing the vintage spec. So um, if you want to do it, you can actually fix that p90 you should be able to take it apart uh pull the magnet flip the magnets the other way and then make the ground the hot and the hot the ground and that should do that that's something more uniquely set uh for p90s that it's it's pretty easy to do um i'm saying that because i haven't looked in that particular p90 every time i say something like this i always have to take into account that they might have found a new way to do something new way meaning to put to assemble a pickup that i haven't seen epiphone always comes up with something crazy and new sometimes uh but the the only advantage is that uh, in the middle position you would get uh, you would you would get a sixty cycle cancellation if that's something you're interested in. That's the only benefit to doing that would be that that specific issue you would get that um, if that matters. Um, so there you go. This is uh this actually ties into a question that I'm going to answer in a video. I'm working on my. Um, music uh my black mountain volume pedal video uh, i'm finishing that up um and um interesting enough i i feel horrible about this um when i did the uh when i did the uh enhancifier pedal video with my 60s reissue, reissue strat there's a comment in the questions and it says how come i'm not hearing 60 cycle hum, hum noise are you using a noise gate i wasn't using a noise gate but i've been using this pedal so much that i'm so used to just going to zero every time I wasn't playing, I was going to zero. Um, and I was just on it every, you know, it's like just so easy and bulletproof. So I essentially, I was, I was using a volume knob as a noise gate. Um, and so just a reminder, you can use that. I'm going to finish the video soon and it should be out. Hopefully I'm hoping tomorrow, uh, if not by, by Sunday at the latest. Okay. Okay, uh, I'm going to say a, a dub, a dub. I'm just phonetically reading it out, man. Uh, it says, is there a benefit to the retailer for me to register a new guitar with the manufacturer? A local shop reminded me to do it for my new guitar purchase last week. Uh, I don't know if there's a benefit to them. They probably reminded you because, um, you know, to for your protection, for your buyer protection. Um, make sure you fill that out. You know, different manufacturers have different, and also I don't know because she didn't say who the manufacturer was. Different manufacturers have different attitudes about the registration. Uh, so, like for instance, uh, you know, things change. So I haven't looked in the recent, you know, months. But um, Fender, for the most part, never had you fill in anything for, to register uh, for warranty. What they had you fill in was questionnaires and send them information. They had you fill out stuff to send them there, but it had nothing to do with the warranty. The warranty was the receipt. So, so a fender said you have a five-year warranty or a lifetime warranty or a two-year warranty. It was from the date of the, uh, of the, uh, the store's receipt, as long as they were a licensed, you know, fender dealer. And, um, 
and that was it. But some companies, basically, their their literature will say you don't get a warranty unless you fill this out, and they might have handed you a product where that that reads that. Um, as far as I know, I've never seen any company that I know of uh, keeping track of any dealers like a kind of like you know, like if you know like at Guitar Center if they can sign you up on the extra uh, insurance plan and they get a spiff kind of thing. Um, I don't think there's any kind of spiffs given to dealers for getting you signed up on the warranty. I don't know what they, I've never seen that before. So it would make me question that it doesn't exist that way. Like I said, they probably just wanted you to make sure you were safe. Plus, not to mention once you're registered, then, uh, you know, if anything goes wrong, they know they can send you to the manufacturer. Because some manufacturers are kind of a pain in the ass on that. Um, one of the things that manufacturers will do, not very many, but some of them do this. When you buy a product, everybody's probably experienced, uh, hopefully they haven't, but probably have experienced this where you get a product and it's it's relatively new to you and it's it's having an issue. And then the, the paperwork says, do not take it back to the retailer. Take it to us if it's defective. So it may be something like that too as well. So, okay. Um, Yeah, Michael says if you buy QSC, fill out the warranty. If you do not, uh, do not, uh, you'll find out the hard way. So there's no warranty. So yeah, um, yeah, there you go. Okay, so let's go back. Okay, why can't I find this? Here it is. Okay, um, we have, I know why, because I didn't refresh my screen. All right. Um, Cam Demand says, hey, Phil, thoughts on selling amps for Axe FX3? I mean, I obviously, I think it's not a bad idea. Um, the piece of advice I would give anybody is this. If you want to, if you're wanting to jump on the Axe FX, the Kemper, the Quad Cortex, you know, whatever it is, you know, like, hey, I don't need real amps anymore. Um, I think that's a bona fide, legitimate <laughs> decision. Um, the only thing I will caution everyone on, and I, I have a friend in particular that I said the same thing to. So, um, you know, he was like, he basically had one, he has one high-end amp and he is all like Axe FX. And he's like, I'm thinking about, he was thinking about, you know, maybe mildly getting rid of that amp. And I said, you'll never be able to buy it again. So here's what I'm going to say. If you're thinking about getting rid of your, uh, you know, and I please take this, you know, the right way, your, you know, EVH, you know, lunchbox, your, your, uh, black star amp, your, uh, made in China, orange amp, your, you know, and there's nothing wrong with these speaker amps. I'm just trying to give you a vibe here. And other than the seriously iconic high end amplifiers, and you want to get rid of those and go to an amp modeling system. I think that's a great idea. If you want to do that and you have some high-end amps, I would definitely pick one or two of those amps, whether they're British-made Marshalls, uh, especially good ones from back in the day, uh, you know, uh, two notes, you know, you, you get the idea, right? <laughs> you know, Amplified Nation, um, you know, any kind of really quality-built amplifier that it's not so much expensive, but just quality by and fire. You're going to see those prices just continue to go. And so I would just hate that in 10 years, I'm not saying you're not going to be happy if you go to Amp, uh, uh, Axe Effects for the rest of your life. You'll be happy for the rest of your life. But you don't want 10 years from now going, you know, I kind of miss having a real amp. Maybe I'll do that. Oh my goodness. Is it $7,000? That's insane. You know, um, there's... So like I said, I wouldn't keep a fleet of amps if you don't want them, but I would definitely pick one or two that you love and keep them. And uh, and I, I think that's ultimately where I'll end up. So, you know, is I've thought about this for years now with amps. I'm There's a few amps. I don't know why I keep looking at the amps. You can't see them. You can kind of see them in this screenshot right here. There's a couple in a row right here. Um, there's just a few amps I love. And then other than that, I'm just on the Kemper. So, so there you go. Okay, next, next subject or question. Uh, 
Uh, Jay Marble says, I can't make it to Kiesel Connect. Will you give us a video summary of your presentation after the event? So my understanding is they don't want any anyone filming. And um, I absolutely, uh, <laughs> I got a chuckle out of the way that was explained. Why no filming? <laughs> so what I had to show it to my wife. The way they explained why there's no filming is they said, you know, no one wants to stand there behind someone with their their phone like this and you can't you know you can't see past them and it just so happened that this that actually just recently happened to my wife she went to a concert where she paid really good money and her and her friend uh had issues with the people in front of them the whole time having i think a tablet or something up the whole time filming and they were like seriously we can't see past what you're doing so i think that's the main reason why they don't want any, they want you to be there in the moment. So I don't know if they're there, you know, if there's any way to film what I'm doing or saying, but, um, I guess the answer would be yes. I'll, I mean, here's the good part. I, I have a, I have a great memory. I'll be talking about it. <laughs> so you'll get some version of it later in discussion, uh, whether I have a, a you know, I film it or not and discuss what we talked about and how it went, and how the, how, how the event went. So like I said, it'll be, so you'll ha you'll have something. Thank you for the super chat, by the way. Uh, Corey Forgave says, thanks, I use small wood block and zero. Wait, thanks. I use a small wood block and zero it out with the calipers when then measure. Just thought you might have a better method. Oh, okay. No, okay, so this is back to the uh, calipering uh, guitar with no strings or with strings. Uh, it says, uh, Leon, Leon, what do you want to know or talk about? Leon wants to talk about, he says, Phil, should I get a PRS DGT SE? Well, you know that the rule on the channel is the answer is you should, or will I still be wanting a core model? Okay. Well, let's, let's talk about that. Most important thing for me is reliability and volume control cleanup. Um, well, reliability, I don't think you're going to have any problems with the SEs versus the cores. Uh, there are all kinds of discussions that are, they talk a lot, the, a lot of the discussions on the internet talk in the, in the, the exceptions and not the rule here. Here's what I mean by that. Somebody will say, oh, don't buy an SE PRS, buy a core because you'll wear the frets out on the SEs because they're used cheaper frets. Wearing out the frets on an SE, if you can do that, you're probably getting divots in your core as well. Um, I've told you guys this before, thousands of guitars. I've done so many, you know, fret, worked on so many frets in my life. The players that can really chew into frets, they are a unique breed. They are not the norm. Um, they do do it. And everyone who does it will tell you, they're going to pop up right now going, I wear my frets all the time. Eddie Van Halen wore his frets out all the time as well. Some players, uh, they have a lot of guitars and they cycle through them so they just don't get enough time on one guitar some players have a much lighter touch some players use different strings strings have a big deal with this i've said this before nyxls are a stronger string than let's say a pure nickel string you're gonna if you put nyxls on a on a guitar with nickel frets versus pure nickel strings you're going to see a difference in hours and hours and hours of play you're going to see that now you're not going to see it in in average play time you know for a home player but like a gigging musician oh yes those those hard frets will will do some damage um you know one of the things about coated strings is they're not only coated to, you know for uh you know for the noise for sliding the noise stuff the coating helps not wear out the string too because there's again less friction and most of the fret wear comes from the playing the same thing over and over and over again. And so you see that with specifically a certain type of musician. It's usually a musician who's playing the, either they're in a band, they're their band and they play their songs all the time, or they're in a, uh, a, a, a band that plays the same covers all the time and um, maybe plays in the same key all the time. Um, but a lot of the average players aren't playing like that. So you're not going to see a whole ton of fret wear that way. So, you know, buying a core guitar for fret life is just not, not feasible. Plus I've always told you this before. I had a, a gig musician who would buy, he would, I mean, look at the price difference of the DGT SE versus the core. You could buy two. Can you wear out two of those guitars frets by the time? And, and, or better yet, you can order a DGT uh, SE 
from Sweetwater, other places too, but Sweetwater, I just know because I was there and I saw them do it. You can order from them and order it with stainless steel frets plecked and they'll put new stainless steel frets on it, ship it to you plecked. Um, I don't recommend that uh, because they'll, it won't be non-returnable. So if you get the guitar and you don't love it, you're stuck with it and no one's going to want to pay you for the upgrades you put into it, but you can do that. Um, the reason to own a core over an SE, hold on, I'm trying to go back to my screen where the questions are. And if somehow, there it is, um, is in my, in my personal thing, I can't tell you why you would do it, or why other people do it. I do it for the collectability part. You know, the guitars that are collectible, it's a lot easier for me to justify putting the money in. When I started playing guitar, when I started, um, you know, working on guitars, when I started being in this business, um, my thought process was if I could buy a guitar for $300 versus a thousand, that's a better investment for me. It's a better deal because I don't need to shell out all that money. Um, over time, what I kind of realized is there were certain guitars I could buy and they will just hold value longer. Now, expensive guitars are not always a better value. They sometimes lose value more than any other guitar. They're pretty, they can be pretty horrific as well, but there are certain just choices. I've said this before. I like Epiphones. I like them a lot. I think the quality is there, playability is there. I have no problem with that. But Gibson is a collectible item, comparatively speaking, to an Epiphone for, for that purpose. Um, SE, same thing. I like SEs. Um, I have an SE and I play it all the time. <laughs> so, I mean, it's good. Um, but a core, and, and also too, you understand, I didn't know this at the time. I wish I would have been smarter about this, but at the time I was buying certain guitars because I thought, at some point they were just going to get too expensive and you can't afford them anymore. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not in, you know, $5,000 guitar mode. <laughs> it's, it's, you can't, I can't, I can't, you know, maybe one guitar or something. I don't know. Like I, I told you, I made my COVID purchase and I kind of feel like that was a one-time thing. So I don't know. This is always a, a tough, tough question for me because ultimately Whenever you talk about buying an expensive versus inexpensive version of the guitar, I always tell you, you won't, you won't regret, you know, a better tool, right? You won't regret if you spend the money for the core. I do believe that. If you buy the core, it's not, you're not going to regret it. But the problem is, I don't know if you're going to regret buying the SE because most people don't. So, and reliability-wise, that DGT SE is going to be great. Okay, Mr. S says, did McCarty design the basic PRS shape? Uh, his Gibson designs look so cool, but I find the PRS look uh, bulbous and funky. Does anyone else think they're weird? Only like the, I only like the Vela shape. Well, I really like the Vela shape too, so I understand that. Um, I, don't, I don't believe McCarty designed, uh, the PRS as far as I know, and from what I can tell, comes mostly inspired from the Hamer guitars. That's where I see it the most from. So, I mean, obviously PRS guitars, it wasn't like a Strat and it wasn't like a Tele and a Les Paul where, and an SG where there really wasn't anything before them. You know, there was guitars that looked like PRSs before PRSs. Um, you know, I mean, he just kind of, like, like, like Paul's guitars to me is interesting because as someone who grew up, you know, he started his company in 85. So think about that. I started playing guitar in 89. So by the time I started playing guitar, he's, you know, four years into the industry. What I remember about PRS guitars when I was a kid was you'd open up Guitar World and you'd see an ad and it was like Santana, I think. And, um, and I love Santana, but that guitar didn't really appeal to me, you know, at that time. I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't into pretty woods and all this stuff. It looked like furniture to me. And, um, and it wasn't until, in fact, my very first real PRS, my first core was painted silver. It wasn't, uh, uh, Nathan has it. This, um, I, I ordered a special as a PRS dealer. I felt bad. I was a PRS dealer for, for many years. I love the quality of the guitars. Um, I went to their factory. I was in, so inspired. I was like, okay, this is great. Um, and, uh, and, uh, but, and, uh, but I did not feel connected to them in any way. I just, it wasn't, like I said, they were like furniture to me. I was like, ah, you know, I like guitars that were just a cool color. Um, and so one day when ordering guitars at the store, I asked, hey, can I just get a custom 22 in silver? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, okay, I'll do that. 
<laughs> I'll do it in silver because uh, I just didn't really understand the pretty wood things at that point. So uh, Lefty Mike says, whatever happened to Hamer? Hamer, uh, they were I, they were owned by Kaman, K-A-M-A-N, which also did Ovation. They were made in Connecticut. Uh, at uh, towards the end, that's where I know Hamer from. So I think Hamer pre that I don't really know much about Hamer. I'd have to look it up. I was Hamers were like ESP guitars to me growing up. I've said this before. They were just you didn't see them. Like I saw Vernon Reed play a Hamer. I saw Gary Hoey play a Hamer. You know, you saw some Hamers someplace. I think I saw uh, Rick Nielsen from Cheap Trick playing a Hamer. You know, you just saw a few Hamers here and there. And um, what I ever saw really in person was Slammer or Slammer or whatever you want to call it. That's what I would see. You would see one or two of those in the store. Um, but uh, Hamer has been sold off. I don't know who currently owns them. I should, I'll look that up. Um, I just know it, when Fender bought Command, I think for a short period of time, they owned it and they sold it off. But Fender doesn't own Command either. There was a whole time during the recession where a lot of companies got bought and sold very quickly con considering the time frame. Joe says, Joe's question is my favorite question. Joe, if I, favorite question of the day, what's the real difference between a thousand dollar guitar and a $5,000 guitar? Joe, there is no difference. <laughs> the, the, the reality is it's not about, see, so this is such an arbitrary question. So let's start with this. This is a fictitious $1,000 guitar and a fictitious $5,000 guitar. And I can say, okay, there's no difference or there is a difference. But what I'm going to tell you is, instead of saying that, if you gave me, Joe, you said, I want these specifications. So don't think of, it, of anything else. You're just like, this is what I want. I want, I'll throw out some stuff, okay? Solid mahogany one-piece body. I want a three-piece, you know, mahogany neck with, you know, with a... Uh, purple hype stripes, whatever the hell it is, right? Um, uh, I want ebony fretboard. I want uh, some expensive pickups, whether that be bare knuckles or, you know, you, you know, name a pricey brand, throw them in there. Um, I want the best tuning keys you can buy, the best bridge you can buy, all of these components. I want all these things and these specifications and I want it to be perfect. And you you said, you gave that to me as a challenge. You said, make that, get that guitar for me. I can find you the guitar exactly for $1,000. Um, it's, it can be done. Now, here's where this gets a little quick. And this is where, like I said, I think this is where some of the gear talk always goes sideways. And I always say I feel unfortunate about this. There's nothing wrong with loving and collecting expensive guitars, just like there's nothing wrong with loving inexpensive guitars that are great. And like I said, I, as making video content, I am more interested in the video where I talk about a guitar for $300 than I am for $3,000 guitar. Um, when I do a video of a $3,000 guitar, I almost come at it like, okay, let's see if I can find a flaw in this thing because it should be flawless. <laughs> when I look at a $300 guitar, I'm really excited about the fact that the guitar is decent. It's good. I'm like, you know, I go into it going, I hope it's good. And then when it's better than good, you're like, wow, this is impressive. So the, the, the there's nothing wrong with the fact that just these guitars are collectible. Sometimes they're referred to as doctor, uh, you know, lawyer doctor guitars all the time, right? These guitars are for lawyers and dentists and doctors and stuff. And, and uh, you know, I understand that comment, but here's what it really is. People like nice things. And so when I look at a, a, a expensive, you know, Gibson Les Paul, like I said, I looked at more like a collector's piece than a, an actual, you know, just a quality instrument. It's a quality instrument for sure. So the answer to your question, what's the difference between a $1,000 guitar and a $5,000 guitar? $1,000 guitar is going to be good. $5,000 guitar is going to be good. And hopefully it'll have a couple other attributes. One of the biggest attributes of an expensive guitar should be the scarcity or rarity of it. Um, because that is a thing. There is a, there is a, uh, uh, I saw a thing. I don't know why this is funny, but I saw this weird thing on, on Instagram or something recently. And it, it made me kind of, it took me off guard. I, I guess it was, um, Justin Bieber and I guess the paparazzi were chasing him. I don't know if this was on the news. I don't know if this was a fake thing. And the, the point of it isn't, doesn't matter either way. 
But apparently he was being chased by some cars and he calls 911 and says, I'm being chased. And they said, okay, where are you at? And he says, here's where I'm at. And they said, what are you driving? And he says the name of the car. And they're like, what is that? He goes, he says the name of the car again. I can't even remember what the car was, but it was a car they never heard of because it was some exotic sports car that was so super crazy expensive, right? And the, in that scenario, that was probably not the best thing to have because, you know, they, they were having trouble understanding what, he, what he's in, right? It would be a lot easier if he was like, I'm in a Corolla. It's red. Um, this is the, oh, Fisker, see? Mesa Guitar Guy. Thank you, Mesa Guitar. He was in a Fisker. Okay, so Google that for everybody. Fisker, it looked, to me, it looked like a sports car, really fancy sports car. Um, the reason I'm, I'm telling you that story is there is something to a lot of players, a lot of people to be able to have like something no one else has. There's something in that. And I've said this before, it doesn't just go to the uh, the cork sniffing uh, elitist that's like, oh, I have this expensive Gibson no one else has but me. Yeah, there's that. But then there's also like, hey, I bought this Squire and I did all this stuff to it. And now it's like, you don't have this. I did this, I modded it. Um, sometimes some of the cooler things is, let's be honest, it's sometimes cooler when you mod or you do cool things to your guitar that's cooler, you know. Here's a perfect example. Look at Eddie Van Halen. He, he takes Crayolon spray paints and he spray paints his guitars and all of a sudden it's this unique guitar and everybody wants it. But when he did it, I'm sure his original thought was he wanted a guitar on stage that was recognizable to him. So, uh, so that's, you know, it's, these kind of, kind of subjects are always kind of funny to me. Okay, so uh, where are we at? Next, we have another question. Soon we will, at least, in a second. And Johnny, thank you so much for the super chat. Man, that was really cool of you. Thank you. Uh, Yamaha RGXTT Guitar Channel says, Hi, Phil. Rob from Oz, I have five 1980s Yamaha Studio Lord LP copies. Have you played one? Hmm, I have not. Uh, I'm gonna Google it real quick just to make sure because I've played a lot of Yamahas over the years. Uh, it says, would you review it if I sent you one and have a beer on me? So let's go over those two things. So, um, oh, okay. This is important. Uh, this is cool. Uh, I have. I have played this guitar. It's a Les Paul. It looks like a Les Paul, guys. Um, yes, I had a customer who had a couple of these, and they were an, uh, infatuated with them, and they had two of them. And I remember working on both. Um, so, yeah, I have. Um, send it for a review would be tough right now. The problem I'm having right now is I, I have more workload than I have capacity um, for a little while. So I've been trying to catch up and it's not working. Um, the uh, I got the new studios done and I was able to pump out a lot of content. I was very excited. And then I got this uh, sinus infection thing that's really got me like just knocked out. Um, the uh, So I'm, I'm really behind. So until I get, so this would be like a contact me later about it kind of thing. Um, Cause the last thing I'd want to do is get in a situation where I have your guitar for months before I get to it. I'm just trying right now. I'm just trying to, uh, to keep, keep going, <laughs> get stuff, get caught up. Like I said, get caught up. So right now it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's tough, especially since, uh, beginning of the year, it seems like a lot of companies reach out really fast and, um, I can't say yes to everything. So we had to prioritize what was, you know, what was most interesting. Like I said, we always, I always try to do the, the videos content the same way. There's three reasons to make a video. Either I want to do it. So I try to do those because they keep me excited. Like I did the head, uh, the amp head box thing. I bought a head box. I thought I'd do a video. Um, a lot of the patrons asked for it, but I thought, you know, it's kind of a video I want to do. Um, and then sometimes you guys like this, you ask for videos and there's a reason to do that. And then of course, sometimes companies ask for videos. And, um, I try to sprinkle those three because I find that the channel does best when I do that. Um, if I do the only the, the videos that companies want me to do, it's more lucrative for me because obviously companies are sponsoring it somehow. Um, but I think that content gets a little old because you see that if a company's sponsoring it, what I've noticed is then you're going to see it somewhere else. So I think this is a great idea for your idea for doing the guitars, but I got to get caught up first. 
Uh, yep, yep says, get yourself a neti pot. I have a neti pot. Uh, so, yep, have that. <laughs> so, there you go. Um, okay, hold on a second. <laughs> uh, I'm just reading some of the stuff you guys are saying. I'm sorry. Somebody said, John Mayer said, uh, Bieber's a great musician. Um, Jimmy John says, what does he say? He says, most hobbyist guitar players lie to themselves pretending they are pros when in reality they are just bedroom players. It's interesting. I I have not experienced that as a whole, but I, I'm not saying that's incorrect. It's just uh, my experience, the uh, some, I think most players are aware <laughs> of their skill levels. Um, the, the reason I say that, and, and Jimmy, you could be, 100% right because we're we live in different parts of the world different places but uh you know one thing i noticed in the store was a lot of players were so insecure that they would actually have you demo the gear for them um that was a big thing having you play the gear for them like hey could you play this for me okay could you play this other thing for me could i hear it um you know a lot of players sometimes aren't very comfortable playing um jimmy where you're kind of right well you're right probably both ways but where you're really right is there's a lot of people with more <laughs> Some sometimes you have to be leery of the person who's like, I play exactly like Eddie Van Halen meets Ingve Melenstein meets <laughs> Eric Clapton. You're like, what? And then you sit watch him play and you go, this is not good. Um, that that I've seen too. So yeah, I see it both ways. But I think a lot of bedroom players are a little they lack confidence. Um, I think that's why so so many of them stay in the as bedroom players. Sometimes you know you try to get them out and to jam with other players and there's a little bit of insecurity there. And I think insecurity is probably the number one thing that holds musicians back. And that's another reason why I've said this before. Um, uh, when it comes to gear, sometimes that's what gear can do. It can give you a false uh, security, which is good, or a false hope or a false whatever. But it's false or not, it's there. It's placebo effect, you know. Um, I've not seen a whole lot of accomplished players feel insecure about their gear. And I have seen it, but not I've seen a whole lot. I have seen a lot of unaccomplished players uh, feel a little better knowing that they have a nice, you know, amp and a nice guitar. Um, <laughs> so that does help a little bit. Okay. All right. Okay, so this came from Amanda. Says Alan says, "Hey Phil, what are the pros and cons of a stereo rig? I'm thinking I'm setting up my modulation pedals, delay, and reverb and on stereo. Will it be a hassle in the end? I want to gig with it. Have a nice weekend." So you asked what the pros and cons. Well, the pros is, is going to sound much better. Anyone who hasn't played through a stereo rig, uh, you haven't experienced it. It's a really beautiful sounding uh, rig. Um, there's no, there's no. Uh, downside to the way it sounds of course you know what the you know what the con is the con is like you said you want to take it somewhere it's a lot of more stuff you have to set up more stuff you have to bring more stuff you have to set up um the irony is if you're willing to do it do it <laughs> you just got to put in more time setting up your stuff uh telly driver says phil is there any need to clean a rosewood fretboard before you're oiling it i have a dry dryness issue in a semi-dirty fretboard uh yeah, do you need to clean it? I would clean it. Um, the reason is, is because when you say dirty, um, a lot of fretboards, whether they're maple or rosewood or ebony, when they're dirty, in my experience, a lot of it is um, they get dirty from you, right? There's nothing wrong with that. We got dirty hands. We're dirty people. Um, sometimes it's the oil and dirt from your hands. Sometimes it's the nicotine. If you're smoking cigarettes, man, that's that stuff. I've, I've, dude, I've scraped enough fretboards with a razor blade. And, and uh like naphtha uh you know from from just the the tar the nicotine tar build up on the fretboards um i've done that many times man surgical gloves it's just a gross experience watching it ooze off the fretboard um not one of my favorite things to do somebody asked me a couple weeks ago what are there things you'd like not like to do on repairs that would probably be one of the ones i don't love and that was never repairs it was always we take your guitars on trade and you want to clean them up before they go on the floor um, somebody says finger cheese. The 11 says finger cheese. Yeah, I'd call it that. Um, the, uh, so should you clean that? I would. 
um, because obviously that stuff, I mean, you're going to put, what's going to happen is if you use the linseed oil or any of the oils that are, that are in these fret board conditioners, they're just going to bond to that stuff and make that all gunky and worse. So I would clean that stuff if, you know, um, now if your fretboard isn't dirty, like I'm describing, well, then that conditioner will also be the cleaner and you can just clean it up, you know, just wipe it clean with a, uh, with a, a nice, I use microfiber, but you can use a cotton or flannel cloth as well. So there you go. Uh, Vincent, by the way, has a suggestion to get two Boss Katanas for the stereo rig. That would do it pretty easy. I mean, that is a good sounding rig if you use two modeling amps as a stereo rig. Uh, you know, that's a great segue comment, you know, co thought for a second. Could you imagine? I, I've never really done it, but that's be interesting to see if you took two Line 6 Catalyst or two Boss Katanas and hooked them up in stereo rig and put it against, let's say, a more expensive single tube amp. I wonder how that you would perceive them as sounding better. So it's interesting. Uh, Mr. S says, who's going to NAM? I will not be at NAM uh, at all. I'm going to be at the Kiesel event that Saturday. Um, in fact, I'm, I just found out today I'm not even leaving until a little later, but I'll be there because um, I had, like I said, I had uh, I have to get this stuff situated um, if it is an infection or whatever, which is which it might be. It's like I said, sinus infection. I have to just tell you on a side note, uh, I am not sick. <laughs> I don't even think anything was wrong. Um, like I didn't, I just started, I had uh, tenderness. And uh, so I went to the doctor and they're like, oh, I think you have sinuses issue. And so they're putting me on, they put me on stuff and the stuff has made me feel horrible, um, which is what's going on. But anyway, so I got to do one more thing to make sure I'm clear and good before I go. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to go to the NAM, but I wasn't really planning to go to the NAM in any way. I think the NAM will be good. I think there's a lot of people going to the NAM. Uh, and I think the NAM will actually be exciting this year. I think there's a lot of exciting stuff to happen. Um, the, uh, and in all fairness, I think even the NAM reached out again and said, Hey, if you want to go, we'll get you a pass and let you go. And, uh, and if I thought I could get it in there somehow, I would do it. But, um, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to be worn down for the clinic or for that day. I want to be there just ready and excited and do the thing and, and, uh, do my thing. Uh, Okay, so the question is, is it normal for a $3,000 guitar to have higher have higher frets? You mean high frets like buzzy frets or high frets like taller frets? Uh, the answer would be, well, no, a $3,000 guitar should not have uh, high frets like bad spots, but also taller frets, yeah, of course. If you notice on the PRS video, we're now going to give you the height of the frets, the type of fret wire. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to be doing that more and more now so you guys can have reference of different fret heights and types. So... Um, this is, uh, this was, uh, why this is, why I had that feature on the deep dives is that it came up as a question with companies. They were using terms. A lot of them are using terms that are confusing everybody, which is, you know, like medium fret wire, right? Medium jumbo fret wire. Um, and in those terms, there are different heights of fret wire. So I'm going to start measuring them. That's why I'm giving you guys that information as well. So, okay. Um, yeah, Yep Yep says, I believe the NAM sort of sucked last year and that they will attempt to redeem themselves this year. I think that's the impression I got. So, you know, specifically what the NAM was reaching out to me for was to do coverage. They were like, hey, we're trying, reaching out to any channels to make sure that they can come and, you know, anything you need to, you know, like if you want coffee and Wi-Fi uh, to, to do content. I, I've just decided for me, I think I've said this before, I don't really ha do a whole lot of content at the NAMM shows and I never really did in the past. Um, if you go back in the history of my channel, I mean, every couple of years I do a few videos. One year I did one video. Um, so, and mostly I would just come back on the podcast and give you guys, you know, the, the long and short of it. This time I'm going to be giving you the long and short of the Kiesel event. So there you go. All right. Hold on a second. Let me grab. I know it's quiet when I'm jumping screens here. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, this came from Amanda Urkosh, if I'm saying it correctly. Uh, Urkosh says, working on my new use. So new to him, Ibanez S512. He got yesterday. Can I actually level some frets by crowning? Um, I would not if you've never... You, it's one of those things I don't want to say no because, I mean, I've, I've done it and I've seen it done. It's not the way to do it. Um, so the answer is... Yes, but I wouldn't recommend it if you haven't done it. Um, you know, I uh, sometimes you have an instinct about yourself, you know, about it. I've had a situation in time in life where you know, like I look at a couple of frets and I go, I don't need to level all these. I'm just gonna use my crowning file and I do it, and it's it works out. Um, fret material. Look, leveling and crowning a fret is not in my ex not in my opinion a very hard, difficult procedure to learn to do. It's not a hard procedure to do, but it's a procedure that if you mess up, it could cost you dearly because you're, because to me, if, you, if you're like me, and obviously you're playing on Ibanez, so Ibanez is used really jumbo frets, which is really great. If you're like me, you like taller frets. I like taller frets. So every time somebody talks about leveling a fret or crowning a fret, reducing the height of the fret, you're going to be changing the instrument to me to the point where I may not like it. So that's why I worry about it. Um, you know, I kind of, I think about frets that way all the time. Like, you know, you want to do everything in your power to not have to remove material, m remove material because you're going to, you can make the guitar not what it was. You know, here's a good example. Um, it happened to me. It happens all the time. Uh, uh, it's funny. You said you're an S512. Um, I bought an S series. I've been in a year and a half ago and, um, you know, it caught me off guard. It caught me off guard off reverb. And, and it was one of those scenarios where I didn't ask the question and technically they weren't wrong. And so I couldn't obviously, I didn't feel I should ask for my money back. What happened was there was a guitar listed and it was like mint condition, plays perfect, right? Um, and it was the color that I wanted, but it was a color and it was not faded, which is very rare of that particular color. And the hardware was not, you know, if you guys know anything about Ivan is a lot of them have pitting. There's the hardware does not last over time. And the guitar was listed as like mint, playing great. The neck plays great. It all plays great. Um, no dead spots. And, uh, and uh, it was a perfect weight. So I bought the guitar and I got it. And when I got it, what had happened was the guitar was 20 something years old, almost 25 years old. He, he described it perfectly. It looks like it's been in a case. In fact, I don't even really quite understand how it ha what. Well, I kind of think I know what happened. The guitar in its case, it looks perfect. It looks brand new. Like I got it out of the case. I was like, this is like a 25 year old guitar. It looks like the day you got it off the, the guitar store that you bought it at. But somebody had leveled the frets to the point where they were almost flat. Like they were just nubs. Um, definitely three crown levels in its lifetime, if not more, which is funny because it has no play wear on the neck, no play wear on the fretboard, no play wear on the guitar, no visual signs of anything, no repaint, no nothing. And so what I think happened was somebody went to level a fret, messed up and just kept going until it was finally level. And then, you know, just, there's no material. Um, so now the only way to make the guitar likable, uh, to me <laughs> is to refret it. So, and I didn't think to ask, you know, has it been refretted or, you know, cause I, you know, he said no divots in the frets and the, and given the, the, I was looking at the guitar as a whole, I wasn't thinking to ask if there was issues with the frets and I don't think he, and honest to God, I don't think he was uh, versed enough to know that it was even done that way. He wasn't the original owner. And I think he probably thought it was fine. I don't think so. So, um, that's my long way of saying, don't, don't do that to your frets. If you don't have to, uh, don't try to use a crown to, to level frets because you could end up in a situation where you're going to really chew those frets down. Uh, Hero Glop, thank you, Amanda, for this one. It says, uh, what do you think of the discontinued Squire standards compared to nowadays uh, guitars? Uh, are they good value, a secondhand market? Um, well, I'm a, I'm a fan of Squire. You know, I've, I think Squire and Epiphone, when I say there's, when I say there's confidence in brands, you know, uh, that's probably the best way to put it. 
um, a lot of times on this channel, a lot of times in these questions, you guys, what do you think of this guitar brand on Amazon? And I'm like, like I said, as long as it's on Amazon and you got a great return policy, you want to take a chance on it. Uh, you know, I, that's why I review those ones and that's why, you know, we talk about them, but I always say like, I, I don't, I wouldn't take a chance on one used and I wouldn't take a chance on one in a, in a platform where you can't guarantee an easy process to return it if you get something you don't like. But when it comes to secondhand market, and it comes to, you know, uh, guitars where I don't have to wor worry about so many disclaimers. Use Squires, use Epiphones, brand name-esque guitars like that, um, you know, I think are a better purchase in the long run. Reason why is because, one, yeah, you can still get into a problem. I mean, if you buy it uh, from a responsible seller, you shouldn't have to worry about it. But if you get it and you, you have a problem, you can modify it and it's a great modifying platform because not because it's inexpensive because it's it's a good guitar like i said squires are great guitars epiphones are great guitars they have come a long way edward edward lou says gear math why not why not using the amplified nation amps for the four thousand dollar demo uh like the 2408 well i used a $3,000 bad cat um, and that was, uh, that was as simple as I just thought that amp and that guitar complement each other. I, like I said, that, that video, um, so, so, so if you haven't done the math on the 24, eight, uh, uh, PRS video, they didn't pay me to do the video and I didn't get to keep anything. So that was, a uh, like Jean at PRS reached out. Um, and I was like, she's like, she sent me, what happened was she sent me the, uh, information, the sheets, I, I don't know, I don't want to say uh, printouts because it was like pictures too. She sent me all the new secret PRS stuff. By the way, they've also told me the PRS stuff for the next couple months, which I think is going to be way, even way more exciting. In fact, I think some of you guys are going to lose your free in mind when you see a couple of things that got coming out. And, and because not only is it exciting, but it's not going to be super crazy expensive stuff. It's not their top tier stuff. But there's two Two th there's two things in particular I, I'm excited about. And I, I shouldn't tease you guys, but I just want to. Um, so, um, <laughs> and uh, and one of them made me kind of chuckle because I'm like, of course, why didn't we all think of this? This is what they should absolutely make. So uh, now that I've teased you guys with that, what happened was she sent me a list of guitars and she says, does any of these interest you? And of the new PRS guitars. And I felt like we were going to be talking about the new tuning keys on the show, because of course, and, and uh, no, no, it's not BCRH 581. It's not a headless guitar. They're, they're not, don't think guitars, think something else. Uh, so, and not pedals and something else. <laughs> so anyways, um, the, uh, what, what's it, uh, uh, oh, so back to the, um, so, so back, back to the, you guys are cracking me up. So, uh, I don't even know what I was talking about. What was I talking about? Uh, oh, the 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 choices. Uh, so when I saw the twenty four oh eight, I noticed that it had the Paul's pickups in it, and I thought, oh, okay, that I'm curious about. Okay, that I'm curious about. So I said, send that out. And then um, when I was making the video, I was like, okay, what amp do I like, and what amp do I like in this, and that's the amp I liked. So that's why I did that. Um, so you know, there's not even like a. So like I said, sometimes, like I've said this before, there are a ton of different reasons why we make content on this channel. It's, it's you know, some of it is because I, like I'm, I'm burnt out. Um, you know, I was burnt out a little bit towards the end of the year last year. So that's why this year I go, I'll do a couple of my pedals. I'm going to do all my pedal videos. Uh, I showed you guys my amp case I did. That was a personal thing. And then I was like, oh, this guitar will be fun. I, and so, like I said, it just kind of keeps it exciting. Uh, let's see. <laughs> you guys are like PRS microphones. I'm not going to tell you guys. And not you guys got. Hey, you guys. What you guys got told is is that there's some cool stuff coming from PRS. That what came out just now isn't the only thing they're releasing this year. They're releasing multiple things. So you don't need to know what it is. It doesn't really matter. What all you need to know is that they're going to be releasing more cool things if you're into that stuff. So. Uh, let's see. Rocky D. D. Montoya has said, it's the, he's a great comment, but he died. he's not saying what guitars were the worst. He's saying these are the, some of the worst guitars I've ever played. I don't know if he's meaning PRSs or what, what he means. So, because, okay.
Okay, so let's do, because we're wrapping up. We're gonna wrap up. Uh, BMAC, thank you, Amanda, says, I have a Fender C shop, custom shop, says C shop, custom shop, 55 reissue, soft V neck, but the neck is huge to me. Yeah, well, that would be the correct neck. I like my PRS wide, thin neck. What Fender neck should I replace it with or or by where? Um, I would go with the 60s neck, anything 60s. Fenders, there's all kinds of necks with Fenders, but if you watch a lot of my videos, I look, everybody, whether you realize it or not, when I started doing the template things with the necks and trying to give you ideas of necks, the reason what I was trying to show you was that a lot of manufacturers, I mean, a lot of them, when you're they're building a guitar, they don't know where to start with a neck. Like that's a really common thing. I, I you know, um, um, I, I once heard a high-end guitar company, a small shop, high-end guitar company. Uh, I, we, we were talking to them, me and a friend, and we said, we really like the neck. And they go, oh yeah. They go, well, we, we like Schecter's, so we just copied the Schecter neck. And we kind of chuckled when we left thinking, so these $4,000 guitars are cloned after a $300 Schecter neck? But that's a great neck. We're like, I guess it makes sense. It's a great neck. I love the Schecter necks. But what I'm trying to point out with the Schecter necks are basically Fender Modern C necks. So a lot of companies, what they do is they just take other guitar necks and then they go, okay, what do I like about it or don't do like about it? And then change it. And uh, and so a lot of companies are copying the Fender Modern C if you want the you know a faster playing neck. I would say for your preference for your guitar, Fender Modern C shape neck or a 60s style neck which is gonna be even thinner. So, um, and just be weary, like I have, I don't, oh, it's very rare, it's very hard to see, it's right here in this corner. This is my Fender's 60s reissue Strat. I've owned two, of, actually, I own two of these. I own two of these right now. One does have the correct C Fender 60s smaller neck, and this one has a chun slightly chunkier one. So there is chunkier 60s era necks, but most of them are gonna be on the thinner side. So, and for that reason, a lot of players were playing the 50s Fender Strats and going, man, these necks are just too chunky. And then they went to the thinner neck. So, love 50s uh, Fenders. I just don't like the chunky necks. Okay. All right. Let's do, wait, it's an hour and a half in. Let's do one more subject or question. Let me see real quick. And then we'll button this show up. And um, while I'm looking, I'm just gonna remind everybody again that if you use the links down below, there's a link to buy some merch if you wanna buy any of the new merch. It's the new stuff and a lot of a lot of the reviews are kick coming in and they're saying exactly what I said. The reviews are, so you know, the shipping costs are a little too high and the quality of the merch is good. We're very aware the shipping prices are high. It was, it was a, you know, I, I, if that stops you from buying it, trust me, I totally understand. All you're doing is supporting the channel when you buy merch. But um, that complaint, although sucks, it's not a complaint I like to hear, is so much better than the other complaints in the old days of, I got the merch and it's faded out. I got the merch, it's not right. I got the merch, it doesn't look good. You know, that was the concern. I don't want to have that situation. So, um, so uh, and then of course, like I said, the Tim Pierce uh, lesson course. Uh, if you guys want to check that out, this is the last weekend for the deal. You'll save 30%. And here's how it works. I should actually, like one little sh last spiel that makes it make sense. You get 14 days to try it out. The, the reason why this is important is, think about this. If you sign up for it, you get to check it out for 14 days. I mean, this is Tim Pierce. He he is he is legit. Like, you, you are not going to find a single person in the comments saying, no, they wouldn't give me my money back and I couldn't get out. You're going to see exactly the opposite. They're super nice. They're great. They're totally accommodating. You don't have to talk to any one person to not, you know, to to not, uh, if you don't want it to do anything more than your 14-day trial. The reason this is important is you get 14-day trial and then if you decide to keep it, you've now saved 30% and they kicked a little back to the channel for us. So we get a little kickback, which is nice. You save some money, which is nice, and you get a course. But at the end of the day, I am not upset and neither would Tim be if you took 14 days and just cruise around and if you got something out of it and that's all you got and you think you're done, I don't think they, I, I know for a fact they don't care. You know, um, Tim is just not wired that way. He's not wired, you know, He's, he's just a musician who likes to share and he does his course. And if it helps you, it helps you. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. So like I said, just be aware you have till Monday if you want to do it. And then like I said, that we, we did a year ago, 
we maybe do it next year in 2025. So this is the chance if you're interested in it to check it out. Um, and then, like I said, you get to hang out with us. Okay. Um, let's do, do we have one more question? Let me subject, let me refresh this. I just want to make sure I didn't miss any super chats as well. And I did. Okay. So, uh, okay. So let's do this real quick. Uh, Grumpy Digga says, I want to treat myself to a 50th present. Oh, 50th, like birthday present? Three years late. <laughs> That's funny. I like that. Uh, it says, I want a custom shop vendor relic 60s era. I have a 62 reissue, 2011, 62 pickups, opinions, love, uh, less Pauls, but it says, I love LP, my complete savings, vets, pension, approximately 5K. Okay. So let's get back to it. So the, uh, the, so you think about getting a 60s era a strat. So here's here's the only thing I want to tell you. I I bought two. I did the same thing, man. That wasn't my 50th anniversary, but our 50th uh, pre birthday present, you know. But it was uh, it was like I like I said during COVID, I did three three consecutive huge expenses. I bought a hollow body PRS, which is slightly out of frame. Oh, it's not on the wall. I'm sorry. It's in the other room. Uh, a PRS hollow body that I was like, oh, you know, uh, I bought a Gibson R9 and I bought a Fender 60s uh, custom shop. Um, this was like the, you know, cookies and beer and depression, you know, COVID sucks and what are we going to do? I'll just buy myself nice guitars. I don't know what that was. Um, the reason I tell you that is that um, this 60s Strat that I got, it one of the things I, I don't love is the high E just rolls off the side, which is really common with that issue uh, guitar. And the other one I think is even worse. Um, uh, so I'm just saying one of the things about the Fender custom shop guitars I've noticed is uh, in the sixties reissues is you want to watch them and see if you can get the ones that are a little bit more modern spec. Um, so like I said, do some research on it is what I would especially, uh, especially since you're paying me in Australian dollars and it's probably gonna be crazy expensive to get it out to you. Um, I would suggest looking at some other options for this, the Fender production 60s strats. If I could go back and do it again, I'd have done that. So uh, the custom shop doesn't mean anything to me. I just did it because I was like, oh, this will be right. And I honestly think uh, I would be happier if I got a 60s uh, reissue production guitar, even made in Mexico uh, over this custom shop. I'm not a huge fan of it. It's, it's, it's good, but... It's not a great guitar. Uh, Mr. G says, what do you do when a used pedal breaks? Call the manufacturer. I can't find anyone who wants to repair it. So you can call the manufacturer. So, so you understand there, there is, uh, you know, whether you, there's a transfer warranty there, who knows? Um, sometimes if it's a smaller manufacturer, small builder, a lot of them, um, are known, uh, to, I'm sorry, I'm laughing because I'm going to tell you something funny. Uh, a lot of them are known to say, hey, send it to me and X amount of dollars, $30, and I'll fix it, right? Especially like the smaller builders will definitely do that. Um, I say that because I always think of the uh, full-tone pedals. And I, I think uh, I think what, uh, what happened, I remember reading on a forum, if you try, contacted him with a used pedal, he said, you didn't buy it for me. You bought it used, so don't bother him. But other than that, other builders are more, more uh, easy. Um, if it's a bigger manufacturer, they, depending on how old it is, they might do something with it, uh, take care of it, whether you're the original owner or not. The other thing is they may have a service center to send you to. And if it's not under warranty, that service center, um, that's where you got to go. Because what you're, what you're talking about is the problem is you can't find anybody who wants to fix it. Yeah, you do, it's going to be tough. There's not a lot of people who want to fix pedals. So there's not a lot of money in it. You know, you can build a pedal for almost what labor rates are now. Uh, so, you know, it's tough. Uh, if you're, if you're talking about a hundred dollar pedal and somebody's building it for 50 bucks and you know, they're like, well, I can sell you one to make 50 bucks or I can charge you 50 bucks. You know, that's a wash, but sometimes they can't even make as much money as if they just sell it to you. So, um, that's what I would do as well. The other thing you can do with the pedal, if it's broken is, uh, is you can go on forums and see if anyone else has had that problem and there might be a quick fix for it. Because some pedals are pedals don't break pretty easy in my experience. All, all, all pedals are built pretty well. 
So generally speaking, not a lot of them are going to have a lot of defective issues. So, um, okay, let's see. All right. Um, and then, and then, uh, this one will end with this one It's a uh, Hawk head 418 says, Hey, Phil, how do we do Kiesel? So if you're talking about the Kiesel event next weekend, it's next Saturday, um, I believe you can still register to sign up to, to go. I don't know if there's factory tours or clinics available, but keep in mind, uh, I'm just going to tell you guys this. If it's not an expensive endeavor, if it's not a far travel for you, if you happen to be in the area and you can sign up because it's free to go, something that I want you to be aware of is that although it's all filled up and all these things are happening, this is the very first Kiesel event. So one thing you want to factor in is that no one really paid for any of this stuff. So because no one really paid for the, the seats in the clinic or the whatever, I don't know if it's standing room or seating in the clinics, but uh, no one paid for that. No one paid for the concert. No one's paying to get in. No one's paying for the um, factory tours. Something that I would expect is that if anything happens, they're not going to go. You know, <laughs> right? They're like, oh, you know, their buddy Dave's like, hey, you want to have barbecue? I'm making ribs and crab meat. And he's going to be like, oh, I was going to Kiesel, but ribs and cr free ribs and crab meat, right? So I don't be surprised if you get there. And I like I said, don't bank on going there and thinking this is you know going to happen if, if it's going to cost you time and money. But if you're thinking about going and you're like, ah, oh, then one of the things sucks, I'm not going to get into those things. I, I would be shocked if there isn't a few spots here and there for all kinds of things because of cancellations. People just not there. You know, they signed up, but they didn't show. So uh, so just keep that in mind. OK, on that note, I hope you guys have an amazing weekend. Thank you so much for another amazing amount of questions and topics to talk about. Um, GM just did one last super chat. He says, uh, hi to all. Glad to catch the part of the live podcast. Will you be at NAM? GM, thank you so much for the super chat. Unfortunately, I won't be at NAM, but I will be at the Kiesel event that Saturday, which is like a 60 minute drive from the NAM show if you want to go. And that's free as well. Like I said, I'll be there all day. And that's where I'm going to put my energy um, because... You know, like I said, I, I just, my big concern is, uh, I'll just be honest. My big concern is I don't want to go to NAM and get sick or ill or tired or anything and then not be 100% at the Kiesel event. I want to be 100% at the Kiesel event. And so I thought about it going, I, I just don't want to chance it. You know, if it was backwards, if the Kiesel event was first and I was going to NAM, I would do that. But given people are actually signing up to see a clinic with me or I, I just don't want to fail those people. So since I don't have anybody I owe anything to at the NAM, <laughs> I just I figured it's just easier to do that way. All right, guys, on that note, I want to thank you so much for your time. And uh, until the next time, I guess I'll say Know Your Gear. The Know Your Gear podcast is not responsible for any spontaneous guitar purchases you make during or 